tonight, Elena Brokaw, the Barbara Bernard Smith Executive Director of the Museum, will interview Jose Alamillo, Professor of Chicano and Chicana Studies at Cal State Channel Islands and the author of many books. The most recent entitled uh, Deportes, The Making of a Mexican Sporting Diaspora. Elena will talk with Jose for a bit, then open it up to all of you for questions. If you would like to write your questions, uh, please do so in the question and answer section that is at the, there should be a link at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll relay those questions to, to Jose before we wrap up tonight at six. Okay, now here is Elena. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much. I don't think we told everybody that you were a member of the museum's board of directors, and we feel very lucky to have you at the helm in our organization. So thank you so much for that and for being here tonight. So I am delighted to be here. I love this program. This is our second episode of Local History Happy Hour. And I'm really looking forward to talking with Jose, um, the author of Deportes. But first, this is called Local History Happy Hour. So we wanna make sure that we get some local history and some happy hour in. So I'd actually like Jose to tell us about the drink that we're celebrating tonight, which is, I mean, he just calls it a mojito, but we call it the alum, Alamojito, Alamio, at Mojito, get it. Uh, so Jose, can you just tell everybody how to make one? And I'll, I'll demonstrate because I have a bar back here. I don't typically have a bottle of Bacardi in my office. Yeah, yeah. So, you're gonna need, okay. So yeah, because I don't have the means to demonstrate so you can do that for So basically the Alamojito uh, <laughs> or Mojito. Um, so it's just my take on the classic Cuban Mojito. Um, when I visited Cuba, several times that was my go-to drink. And so basically you want to start with a just a tall glass and you want to get two teaspoons of white sugar cane. And then uh, you want to also get some, um, some mint leaves, right? So you have mint leaves, right? So you want to basically um, put in the mint leaves. You want to add a half a lime and then a half of lemon as well because you want to get that juice in and you want to smash the sugar cane with the stem of the of the mint right so i like to use sort of the you know the 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 mint that's sort of like this it's kind of like the yerba buena is we call it in spanish or it's you know tall mint mintish and so the stems have a lot of flavor so you want to mash with a with a muddle or a spoon you want to just kind of you know smash the the leaves with the sugar and then the lime and lemon will mix with it and it create a really very flavorful juice, right? And then you basically, when you finish with that, then you wanna add um, a shot of white rum. And of course, Bacardi would do, but you know, I like the Havana, the Havana Club rum, which is really good. Um, and then you wanna add some soda water or club soda or just sparkling water. I, you know, usually alternate between any of those. And usually you want to add yeah, like maybe half, <clears throat> like a half or, or, or one cup, half a cup or one cup, depending on how tall your glass is. But you definitely want to leave room for ice. You want to ice it with just ice on top. And then if you have like any bitters, you can put a few drops of aromatic bitters. And that should do it, right? Just put a little lime peel on the top or a little mint leaves and you're ready to go. All right, so here's my Alamogito. It's it's not as good as his, but it's, you know, I'm getting there. So thank you for walking us through that. So while the rest of you are putting together whatever you want to drink, doesn't have to be an Alamogito. Um, let's talk, let's get the local history in here. So uh, Jose, we're going to talk about your book, which is about, it has some local history, but it's uh, from a while ago. So just before we talk specifically about that, can you just give us your favorite sports story from Ventura County? I yeah, I yeah, I no, I have many. No, right. That's a that's a that's a really tough question because I have many, many, many stories. But I I like to share the story of how sports, right, um, leads to uh, two people falling in love. Right. So the story that I like to show is my friend um, Ernestina Navarro Hosaki. I know her, I call her Ernie. She likes to be called by Ernie. So Ernie was a Mexican-American young girl 
who moved from El Paso, Texas in the 40s, around right after World War II. And she was always a big sports um, athlete from school. And then she, she, she gravitated to, towards playing softball. Anyway, so she wanted to um, find out if she could play. And so she, when she moved to Oxnard, she visited the Oxnard High School field. And there she met a young man uh, by the name of Butch, Hos uh, Butch uh, Hosaki, who is a Japanese American um, baseball player. And, you know, she would watch the, the team play, but Butch was watching her, <laughs> watching him. And so eventually, you know, they ended up, they were friends. And then eventually he uh, proposed to her to on a date. And at first, um, her parents were against, you know, dating outside the race, right, uh, Japanese American. And she was, of course, Mexican American, very traditional Catholic conservative family. And so eventually they fell in love and <laughs> they married and had a beautiful family, two young girls um, that ended up going and playing sports. And so I like to share her story because, because of Butch, right, she continued to play ball. Like even while she was, even while she was having kids, like literally she played for the Oxnard Merchantettes, the Kotler girls softball team from the late 40s up to the early 50s. She at one point um, got recruited for, uh, for a scholarship by Redlands University, but it was really hard for her to leave her family. And so it wasn't something that you would do in the late 40s, right? Leave the family, go to college. And so it was really hard for her. So she didn't end up taking it, but she continued to then promote sports within her own family and and not just within her own family but within the community right so she ends up being very active in, uh, and still very active with the uh, Wilson Senior Center she's actually there volunteering she was um, for a long time an employee with the Oxnard School District um, and uh, she's always been to me like one of those inspiring stories of of a young girl who despite you know the barriers in front of her right and despite you know, um, being discouraged from dating outside. She ended up marrying somebody outside and, you know, they had a beautiful family and, you know, she continued playing sports. And so, so I, I talk about her in my book, about her story, because I think it's really inspiring. And so she continues to inspire me. We were still in touch and she's been recognized at several events, both at my university, but also at, as part of the Latino Baseball History Project that I'm involved with. Um, and she accompanies me. So we go and we drive there together, San Bernardino and we had a great day out of it. So, yeah. So I think that's the story I want to share. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about your book. And we'll get back to some uh, more local stories later on. Um, but this book that we're talking about today, which is Deportes, The Making of a Sporting Mexican Diaspora. And by the way, I am not even going to pretend to try to pronounce all of the Spanish uh, words correctly and names correctly. I just, I'm just not. So, uh, so please forgive me. Um, but this book is an intellectual study of a very popular topic or very popular yeah. thing everywhere, which is sports, right? right? Um, and this book specifically explores Mexican athletes and athletics, uh, both in Mexico and in California in the first half of the 20th century, so 1900 to 1950. And while the book is all about sports, it really uses sports as a lens or as a reflection of the bigger issues facing this community. So you start the book talking about Fernando Valenzuela, which is so great because I read it right after his 50th anniversary and the, all of the stuff and it took me right back to Fernando mania. <laughs> um, and so while the book starts with a story about a single athlete, you really make the point that although we often talk about athletes as these heroes that are born, you know, whole cloth and they're just, we talk about their individual achievements, that's not at all the case and it's about a network. And I actually, would like you to read us a quote from the introduction of your book, I think on page three. Mm -hmm. I forgot to remind you we were going to be doing that, but would you mind doing that, the last paragraph right before Sporting Mexican Diaspora? Yeah. To give people a sense of the book? Yes. Um, so um, I'm going to read that, that quote that really, I think, encapsulates a lot of um, what you just mentioned. So. 
I'll start with sports narratives are too often centered around individual achievement, which obscures their communities of support. Latino sports heroes have been made not only through individual effort, but alone, but also through the support of networks of families, coaches, managers, promoters, organizations, sports writers, and fans, right, who have opened these athletic opportunities for them to compete and to represent their communities, but also their nations at home and abroad. So these networks of support um, are not tethered to the nation state, rather Mexican origin athletes have used these networks across national borders, which I call transnational networks, to challenge racial, gender, and class barriers imposed by the sports industry or by, by government officials or the media. And so in the process, what they're doing is they're creating what I call a sporting Mexican diaspora. Okay, and by the way, just for the non-academics among us, me included, can you define diaspora? Yes, uh, that's actually one of those words that like even my students are like, what? <laughs> what is diaspora? And so I always start with, well, let's go back in history, right? Diaspora, right, typically refers to a forced dispersion or a forced displacement. And, and typically we know of a diaspora uh, because of the experience of the Jewish people, right? That were forced to flee and were displaced because of religious reasons, religious reasons, right? But I'm using the term, not just in terms of like religious displacement, but also in other kinds of displacement, like political, economic displacement of people, right? Who are fleeing their homeland for those reasons. So um, I, I actually argue that when we, when we talk about the Mexican population in the US, it actually can be viewed as a diaspora, meaning that they have experienced a history of physical, political, and economic displacement. And some would even argue religious displacement when we think about uh, the Cristerio Wars in the 1920s, which is which was with this this war between the church and the state, um, and they experience in the you know once they are dispersed and flee because of that, they experience a form of alienation in their new host land, right? And while they're in their new land, um, they have this yearning right for their homeland, and it, it's a kind of yearning that means that they want to kind of represent that homeland. They want to be able to affiliate both at an emotional level, but also at a more um, broader social level. Um, because, you know, many of them want to represent the homeland they led in competition. So I'm thinking here of the Olympics, right? We see many players who return to their homeland to represent them in international competitions. So the other thing about diaspora, right, is that they actually go on, they undergo a kind of cultural change uh, and, and a change in their identity, right? Because they're now having to grapple, right, with what am I, right? Between host land and homeland, what do I call myself? You know, what culture do I adopt and practice? And so that's really the crux of, you know, them finding a new identity through sports is they, they do embrace a kind of hybrid identity, which is a mixture of both Mexican identity, but also an American identity. And that's how we create hybrid identities as, as, as I talk about in, among my athletes. And so it's a, it's a relationship, right? That they have between the US and Mexico that they're able to negotiate and create. Yeah, and again, so you're thinking about it specifically through sports, but that is reflected in the entire experience, right? So yeah. this book takes, takes a, a a human experience and makes it very specific, right? And this right. one uh, element. And okay, so the book has chapters on a number of subjects. So it starts off with kind of um, amateur sports, YMCA in Mexico, and uh, there's a chapter on boxing, there's a chapter on baseball, there's a chapter on sports in wartime. So tell us if you could, what is the through line? What is the main message of the book? Um, so the, the, main less, the, the main lesson really uh, 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 is basically that when we think about sports, we have to think about it in a broader sense. We can't think about sports as just who won and who lost. 
So what, what we need to we need to ask is why does sports matter? Well, it matters in society where you have people that are still facing many different barriers and obstacles. So I like to think about the the many players who despite their class barriers, meaning they're poor, they didn't have enough money to buy equipment, they found a way, right, to play. Despite the, the, the racial discrimination they faced, they were not allowed to play in certain ballparks. They were not allowed to join certain teams. They found a way. <laughs> so to me, it's about looking at sports in, in a more politicized way, right? Like, so thinking about the understanding that through sports, we can learn more about racial, class, and gender differences. Um, we, look, we, we, can, we can see how uh, they were able to use a platform of sports to not only uplift themselves, but also their communities, to represent their communities, not only in terms of like their town or you know, their team, but also their nation, right? And, and, and we definitely see that when they're able to get at the level of uh, professional and uh, you know, Olympic you know, competition, that they're able to kind of represent more than just themselves, but their nation, right? And so to me, then, then it tells us about sports is having this more symbolic social significance uh, beyond just playing a physical sport, right? They're actually representing much larger communities and nations and causes too, right? But, but definitely, um, you know, they're, 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 and, and also just, just in a very basic point, to me, I wanted to write this because I wanted something out there about Mexican people that was positive. You know, in the media, in political discourse, we hear a lot of negative things about, you know, Mexican people are bringing in the worst, they're, you know, rapists. And, and I wanted to write a, a book to counter that narrative, to say, look, Mexican people are contributing in very positive ways to the society. And one of those ways that we can see is through sports, right? They are giving back by creating amateur sports leagues and organizations. They're really channeling the energies of youth into positive productive ways. Like they literally are helping to reduce any kind of you know, crime or juvenile delinquency because they understood how sports can function as a form of discipline, but also build up teamwork and leadership skills so they can then translate and transfer over to other areas of life. Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, what you're describing is a sort of virtual, virtuous cycle, right? Because at the beginning, we talked about how the network is so important, and it's not just the individual's um, abilities, but then you have a network supporting athletes who in, in turn support the network and increase the pride and everything, create a stronger network. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I found that a lot in the book. There's this kind of um, story of spaces like ball fields yeah. where that are the space where community is built, exactly. right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so the book is very specifically about the first half of the first 50 years of the uh, 20th century. Why, why did you choose that? Uh, you know, first of all, that's a period of what we call the golden age of sports. <laughs> that's really when sports takes off in this country. I mean, when we think about sports it's a much modern sports right when we think about either baseball boxing right really we see that happening in the 1920s right the 1920s was this golden age of sports and what that's also when we see their first sports stars sports celebrities like babe ruth you know and then also boxers right um you know we see the rise of these important uh, boxers that become big. And so to me, that's really significant because typically when we hear about the golden age of sports in the 1920s, what's left out is that, yes, Mexican people were part of that boom, <laughs> that movement. Um, and, and so were many other groups, right? So, so I think that what we see is in those periods that 
for the Mexican population, they gravitated towards two main sports initially, that was baseball and boxing. And those were the primary sports for, for a while, for, you know, since the late 19th century, they've been playing baseball. It's one of the sports, right, when we think about baseball, that they brought with them, right? It's not one of the sports that was, um, you know, they had to learn while arriving in, in the U.S., um, in fact, I would argue that there were other sports that they brought with them, including basketball. You know, people think, oh, you have to learn it when you're in the U.S. because that wasn't played in my country. No, that was played in Mexico through the YMCA, <laughs> you know. Um, the other sport they brought with them, right, was soccer. But what's interesting about soccer is that it wasn't very popular in the U.S. In fact, they was like, they shunned that sport for a long time. They, they thought that that's not an American sport, that's a foreign sport. And so... And boxing was adopted early on in Mexico, and they brought that with them as well. So what we're, we're learning is that they were also bringing in sports from their country to the U.S. and thriving, right? They were organizing, you know, uh, matches. They were organizing leagues. They were um, all kinds of um, celebrities that were gravitate to these sports and they and they were also using Hollywood connection to sports in very interesting ways because remember that in the 1920s and 30s you also had a boom of Hollywood right films movie stars and so they were also bringing in those Hollywood actresses to say do a you know pitch the first you know ball <laughs> in the game or they would bring it to attract fans or you know, they would have these kind of celebrities as a way to pr promote and publicize sports. So, uh, and the other reason why I wanted to focus on this period was because of the Olympics. You know, we forget that 1932 Olympics was held in Los Angeles. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people very, you know, people think, oh, wait, wasn't that 84? Yeah, that was mm -hmm. the second time. <laughs> that was not the first. So, and so what's interesting about 32, right, is because that, that Olympic game was very international. It was very widely publicized. This is where Hollywood gets into the game of promoting the, uh, the, the Olympic games. It was very much mass media getting into that. So it really becomes very um, highly publicized and commercialized early on in the 30s with being in LA. And, and, and Mexico was represented in those games. However, they needed help with, with the funding. And so who do they turn to? Well, they turn to the Mexican American community to raise funds. And so they actually rely on the, on the generosity of many of the Mexican Americans who already established themselves by having businesses here in LA by helping to support these athletes, hosting them, having dinners for them. And, and so they actually also encourage many of them who had been born and raised and gone through high school here in LA to then compete for Mexico. Like literally they gave them slots to join the boxing team and to compete against other countries. Like, I mean, again, that just shows you, right? That the, 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 the notion of diaspora being beyond Mexico into LA in Southern California and encompassing that community to represent Mexico. So I wanted to I wanted to share that story of the Olympic Games because that that that's really important why I focused on the 1930s. So there's I want to actually talk about you a little bit and then I want to ask you about a couple of specific stories in the book because they're really great stories and I want you just to tell them to the people who haven't read this book yet. But let's talk about you for a little bit because you you're clearly in this book. I mean, you you talk from the first person in the intro and in the conclusion, yeah. but you're you're obviously you're you're, you're a through line. So, tell us about you. Like, were you uh, where were you born? Okay. Uh, where's your family from? Okay. Um, are you from Ventura County originally? I am. Yes, I'm a local boy. <laughs> That's local history. Like, I'm a literally a product of local history. <laughs> um, I want to share the story of my family because that's such an important part of why I wrote it. Um, you know, I, well, first I was born in, in Mexico in, in a small town in Zacatecas, but I arrived here when I was seven. So, so, but when I arrived, I arrived into a, a place that I, that was familiar. Like I never saw this place as being foreign in any way. Part of the reason is because my grandfather had lived here in the 1920s and thirties. 
but I, but I didn't really, it didn't really dawn on me until much later because one of the things that, I, that he would do is he would teach me English words in Mexico because he had learned to speak English while he was a young man. He came at the age of 15 to work in the Oxnard sugar bee factory and then later in the uh-huh. citrus orchards in Santa Paula. He actually lived on 303 Citrus Street in Santa Paula. Like I actually looked it up on the census. <laughs> and so there's all these stories about my grandfather that I grew up with. And so I knew, and he was a big baseball fan, by the way. So I knew that, and boxing fan. He was a big baseball and boxing fan. In fact, he loved to box. And he would tell me stories of some of the early boxers from Ventura County, like, you know, and I was like, who, like, who are these people? Like, and he knew a lot of people, like even when he came to live with us later when he was much older, he would have all these friends visiting. I'm like, who are these people? Why? And so it never dawned on me that like, wow, there's a story here, you know, because I was a young, you know, teenager. I didn't really care to, to speak to the grandpa. But but I always grew up with this 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 idea that I that this place is familiar to me. This is not foreign. I've always lived here. And because of my grandfather, right? He kind of just made it familiar for me. And and also he encouraged me to play Little League, right? So I was part of the Sadako Little League along with my brothers, but it was only brothers, not sisters. <laughs> I want to emphasize that because we'll get to that. Um, and we, you know, so sports growing up for me was very common. And uh, I, with my cousins that lived in Oxnard, we would play at a Royal Verde Park every weekend. I'd be there, you know, so I grew up with just this love of sports, you know, whatever, whether it was baseball, football, you name it. <laughs> but, but, but the 80s was significant because of Fernando Mania, like, as you mentioned, right, the 50th anniversary is not too long ago. So it's like, wow, you know, 81 and why, why that year is so important is because you know, he breaks into the scene. Um, he, you know, gives all these you know, hitters. He helps the Dodgers win the championship. And it's like all of a sudden there's Fernando Mania and we're like, hello, why did it take so long? <laughs> like literally I was asking this question, like why did it take 81 for the American people to actually witness and see a, a Mexican sports star emerge. Mm-hmm. Like wh- why 81, you know what I mean? And I kept wondering about that question always. And so I, I wanted to explore that historically. That we've always, we've always been here. We've always been stars, not at the level of professional perhaps, but we've had professional players before, but they never reached that level in part because of the media, right? Was <laughs> was very different. So that's really why I wanted to write this book because uh, Fernando Mania for me, like just reminding me of all those times that we, that we, we were part of that mania, right? That we would sit around and watch Fernando pitch and my, my father, who is the biggest sports fan that I know religiously, literally cannot miss his Dodgers games. Cannot miss, <laughs> you just can't. So he's not watching now. Because he's watching. The I Dodgers. hope not. But <laughs> the way the Dodgers are played, he may be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm know. sorry. If somebody but... out there can get us a score, put it in the chat. We, we need Seriously, to know what's happening. We need some help here. <laughs> <laughs> Losing uh, four out of 11 games in the last 15 is just not very encouraging. <laughs> and my dad would tell you why, too. Like, he would like, literally break it down for us. So, oh, well, but yeah, we'll have him on next week. And he can tell, he can help us all. He can talk to my husband who's out there probably yelling at the TV. All right, so I wanna, I wanna talk about uh, a different sport for a second because I love this story. So I think the second chapter in the book is about boxing, which by the way, I don't like boxing. I don't care about boxing, but I thought the chapter was very, very interesting. So, you know, anyway. Uh, so, and one of the things that I noticed is, you know, in in that time period when you talk about it, there's some things that have really changed and there are some things that have not. And one of the fun, not fun, but one of the really compelling stories in the book was the story of the two um, Mexican boxers in 1933. And I think it's Babyface Casanova and um, Luis Villanueva, uh, Kid Azteca. Yes. And their journey from Mexico to the U.S. to play in L, to box in LA yeah. in their 
yeah. experience at the border. So can you tell that story? Oh my God. So that's a story that I, I was not, well, first of all, I, okay. So boxing is big in my family. Like we have boxing nights in my uncle's house religiously every Saturday night. And we, <laughs> we do this ritual where we like do, um, like we kind of do like a, like a kind of like a betting thing. <laughs> So and we, I won't go into detail about that, but yeah, I, I'm, is there anybody from the county on this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, it's fake money. So if you put your money in, you have to bet which round uh, there's going to be a knockout. And so there's a variations of that. But eventually, whoever, you know, gets the round uh, wins the whole pot, right? That's the basics of that. Um, but so, so I, so I, so in my family, it's a tradition, right? And but I've, but I've always known, you know, growing up, you know, I've always known there was always this interesting, like, divide between the generation, like the older generation that would support these Mexican boxers, and the newer generation that would support, like, Mexican-American boxers. Like, Oscar de la Hoya was a huge boxer in, in my generation, and we would be like, yeah, but then, like, the older generation would be like, no, the true Mexican boxer is Julio Cesar Chavez, you know? So there was always this like rivalry, right? A generational divide between the two boxers. So I wanted to explore that. And so that's why I was digging deep into the history of boxing. And I, and I found that, yes, we see that divide even historically, like there's always been that tension. But what, as I was going through the record of the immigration, so I wasn't even thinking of writing about the story until I ran into the, the court case. There was an actual immigration court hearing about these two boxers because Kid Azteca and Babyface Casanova were held at the border in El Paso and in, in Ciudad Juarez. They were barred from entry. And it's like, why would these boxers who are well known, their, 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 their match is coming up at the Olympic, uh, you know, the Olympic Auditorium, which is a big boxing venue in LA. And it was highly publicized. <laughs> we knew they were coming for boxing, but they were, they were told not to say that to the authorities that they were coming here for tourist reasons. So they were in many ways discouraged from saying they were, why, why did they do that? Why? Because there was a law. There was a law called the Foreign Act. In immigration law, the Foreign Act prohibited from any immigrant coming into the US to work and earn money. It was a, basically, it was a contract labor law that they were breaking. So they couldn't come in and, and earn money. They would be breaking the law. So they were, you know, advised to say tourist reasons. And of course, the authorities are like, yeah, they're not only like big boxing fans and they know who they are. <laughs> they're like, hello, they presented the evidence. Like, uh, I think you're in the paper. They actually showed them. <laughs> so they're, you know, they were caught basically in this lie, right? That, and, but, but to me, I wanted to, they were being really used and manipulated and exploited by all sides. The boxing industry was exploiting them, the matchmaker, the people who were making money off it. And it was really unfortunate circumstances they found themselves in, right? And so then they had to resolve it. Well, how? Well, the matchmakers and the promoters, they have connections in the Department of Labor. <laughs> so they call up their friend in the Department of Labor and they say, can you give them an exemption? Can you like allow them entry so they can, you know, like actually fight these matches and make a lot of money for everybody, you know, including the betters, <laughs> including the matchmakers and the betters. Um, and so basically they were allowed entry eventually, but it wasn't because of just the people who were make, you know, who are gonna make money, but it was also because the meat that it really had to do with the sports journalists from the Spanish language media, the newspaper, and they were really trying to highlight their plight. Look. If you're gonna bring in Mexican boxers, please allow them to at least make a living out of this. Allow them to practice their craft. And so they really made a case for them to be allowed in uh, on a bond, right? But then they had to leave you know, after a certain amount of days because they couldn't stay for a long time. Uh, but it really just highlighted how exploitative the boxing industry can be. Um, and these, these boxers, you know, they were really good but unfortunately, they, they had a, such a bad experience with immigration authorities that they refused to fight again in, in the US. In fact, they returned to Mexico and just basically continued their career in Mexico City, never to really return back because of that experience. 
Okay, so I, I, I see that there are a lot of questions coming up and I can't believe the time is going by so quickly. Oh, damn. But I wanna, and I have a bunch more questions, but I'm just gonna ask you one other question about sort of the uh, American athletes going to Mexico in baseball. Because you talk about that, uh, was it in the 1930s that there was, or the 40s? Um, you know what I'm talking about. Can you talk about that effort by um, the, the guy, the millionaire who created the Mexican oh, yeah. baseball league? Yeah, yeah, Jorge Pasquale. And the American and the, all the American um, players that he uh, recruited. And after that, we'll take some Q and A. And if we have time, I have some more questions for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Jorge Pasquale was a millionaire, a Mexican millionaire, who uh, essentially created the Mexican League, which was the counterpart to the the Major League Baseball League. And so they were really well funded, well resourced. In fact, they had enough money to recruit American players to go and play for Mexico, and they did. But guess what? <laughs> Major League Baseball did not like that. Oh, how dare he raid our leagues? How dare? And so they actually barred, right? Any player that would go to Mexico and they could never play again for professional baseball in the U.S. Well, that, just, that right there just highlighted the exploitive nature of Major League Baseball, right? Because they didn't have any, at that time, they didn't have any unions or you know, rights as players, right? Essentially, you know, they had to fight the reserve clause. And so that's really, because of the Mexican league really led to the creation of a player's union and um, eventually, you know, the integration of baseball because the other thing they did was they actually brought in Negro league players. And that's also the part of the story that is really important is that Mexican baseball was actually responsible for the breaking of the color line, why? because they highlighted the Negro League players that could play professional. And they were so good in the Mexican League. You know, I can name numerous players that played for the Mexico and highlighting that they could play at that level and beat any anybody. And so again, highlighting how Major League Baseball was really behind the times in terms of integration. And so again, that that's also part of the story. And then also share how it was also them recruiting Mexican-American players who wanted to go professionally, but were not given those opportunities in the US. So they go and play for Mexico's teams and actually become coaches as well. So they're given opportunities in Mexico's baseball league during the 1940s. Uh, and, and that was really important, right? Because eventually, um, you know, they're given that experience, they're gained that experience and they eventually come back and return to the US because eventually, you know, that league is, is ultimately uh, abolished by, by, the, by, because Pascal, you know, he's, he dies in, a car, in an airplane uh, crash. And unfortunately, it doesn't continue on with the funding from him, right? Uh, which, you know, I wonder what could have been, right? If it continued, uh, what would have been rivaled Major League Baseball? It would have actually seen really a more North American baseball league one that actually is truly would hold a world world series <laughs> that's actually representing more of the world than just the u.s <laughs> just, to add, I just i just wanted to highlight that <laughs> well i'm going to turn it over because i can see that in the chat and in the q a there are some questions coming up and uh our deputy director denise sindelar i think this is the first time we've seen you hello denise uh, is going to handle all the Q&A and relay those questions to Jose. Great. Okay, the first question we have, Jose, is from Andres Garcia, and he's asking, does the book talk about Ted Williams at all? No, you know, I kind of left him out. Uh, part of the reason is that there's a lot of debate over Ted Williams. Okay, so, there's a so the debate is, can he be considered a Latino baseball player? Is should he? Because throughout his professional career, he denied that he was Latino or had any Mexican ancestry. We know that he did. His mother was Mexican. <laughs> his father was, you know, I think European. I don't know what from what country, but uh, Williams, right? Ted Williams, very American name. Definitely could pass. Um, so he understood that in the 30s and 40s, there was a lot of discrimination against Mexican people, and he didn't want to go through that. So he denied having any kind of Mexican um, ancestry. 
all through until much later, right? That it was revealed that no, he did. <laughs> he just didn't talk about it. He didn't even admit it publicly and professionally. And so I, I just feel like, you know, here's just a case of one of those individuals, right? That was kind of perhaps, you know, torn, conflicted, you know, uh, because it, there was his private life and public life. He didn't know how to negotiate the two. He probably wasn't counseled or advised very well. <laughs> I think he should have owned his, the fact that he was mixed and biracial and, you know, and I wish he would have because that perhaps would have given more attention to the need to recruit more talent from that community of San Diego. Because remember, San Diego was a very much a baseball town and there were really amazing baseball players from San Diego, not just Ted Williams. I mean, when you think about, you know, the San Diego Padres, I mean, they were part of the, you know, Pacific Coast League before it became, you know, a professional league team. And there were many good Mexican American players, Manny Luna, uh, you know, um, is one of that comes to mind, but many others that were really amazing from San Diego Padres. And I just wish that if Ted had come out as a Latino player, he would have given that opportunity to those that would follow from San Diego. He never did. So I just, I just feel like in my mind, <laughs> in my estimation, and during that period that I talk about 1900, 1950s, he didn't, you know, he wasn't a Latino player. He didn't identify as such. So why would I talk about him? <laughs> so it's, that makes perfect sense. So next question is from Christian Walk, and he's asking, uh, can you talk about how Mexicans and Mexican-Americans use social networks created through sports to engage in political and or label, labor activism outside of sports? Yes, um, definitely. Um, so I, I talk about several teams, one in particular that actually, that I show the clear connection between labor and, and baseball. So, so, so in, in my first book, actually, I started that conversation when I talk about one of the teams that the coach was a labor organizer. So he was both a cap, the coach of the team, but he was also a labor organizer. So what he does is he does this. He actually uses the ball field as an organizing space. Why? Because the employers wouldn't know that they're actually organizing. They're actually you're strategizing plays. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're, they're not doing that. So, so, so the ball field becomes a, a kind of a safe space to talk about politics, but also to organize in ways that extend outside the ball field. But we also see that through, in my book, I talk about how these sporting networks become very much politicized because I talk about the Mexican, uh, Amer the Mexican Athletic Association of Southern California, that what it, what it does, it becomes this sort of amateur league that organizes teams throughout Southern California. One of the things they do is they forge a relationship with Mexico's sports federation. The reason they did that is because they wanted to use leverage from Mexican government to push the city of LA to open up its uh, sporting venues, like its ball fields, its uh, basketball courts for these youth because they were trying to charge money for these, these, these players who had no money. Like it was, so they were trying to make it really difficult for them to play sports and tournaments and matches in LA's recreational fields. So they push back against the city recreation to say, hey, if you want to help us to like, you know, deal with this juvenile delinquency problem that is happening, why, why are you prohibiting us from playing in, in a tax paying sports facility that we are actually taxpayers as well? And so they had to push against the city to allow them to then you know, have these spaces available for free, right? So that's how they become involved in politics. By, by getting involved you know, in, in the city politics through this league, this, this, this athletic league. And they use their connection with the Mexican government to say, hey, LA, you're not practicing the good neighbor policy that you're supposed to be. Because according to Franklin D. Roosevelt, we have a good neighbor policy that we're all supposed to be you know, friends and good neighbors with Mexico. Where is that? How come we're not seeing that? <laughs> See, 
So they were using the language of the good neighbor policy also to leverage and to get more, um, more um, you know, uh, benefits and rights and, and, and opportunities for youth, for Mexican American youth. Okay. Our next question comes in from our chief curator, curator and your colleague, Ana Bermudez, who wants you to speak to, um, Jose, we know that with Chavez Ravine, the yeah. displacement of its residents, many Mexican Americans refuse to support the Dodger yeah. Nation. Fernando Mania changed that. Can you explain how and why? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, you know, Fernando was a, a kind of a, a, he came at a moment where we needed kind of that healing for many players who had really had very bitter taste against the Dodgers organization. Um, I think one of the things that he did is that, first of all, he was he was new to the area, right? He didn't even speak English, right? He he didn't know a lot about the history. He even admits in, in one of the Dodger uh, Do Dodgers documentary that he didn't know about Chavez Ruiz. <laughs> you know, he didn't know that this was happening. You know, but I think that um, he was such a, an important figure to be able to bridge. Um, that divide that existed from an earlier generation that was more, I would say, Mexican American generation that had fought, you know, for the U.S. and wars that had came back and were displaced from Chavez Ravine, and so he, I think, he helped the Dodgers organization kind of make amends with that community, and he did it through making sure that that the Dodgers would would kind of change the way that it connected to the community, right? So. You know, it highlighted the importance of Jaime Harin. Jaime Harin, I mean, you know, Jaime Harin is so important because, you know, we know Vince Scully is great and we love his voice, but Jaime Harin is the voice for many Dodger fans. And so bringing prominence to his role of broadcasting games in Spanish is so important. So to be able to be genuinely outreaching and connected to the community through, you know, Spanish language broadcasting, but also to making sure to highlight the you know the achievements of of Fernando and but also other players right because I think that that Fernando opened the door for other players that come after him right and so I think that that becomes a moment for healing for for a lot of the fans right where before you know they didn't want to set foot on Dodger Stadium but they were going to make an exception for Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> just to witness the, the amazing pitching right as he you know unwinds that and looks up to the sky <laughs> I mean come on like who cannot want to witness that he's a legend that's for sure okay so Cynthia Duarte wants to know can you speak to Mexican and Mexican-American women in baseball yes I was hoping somebody would ask that thank you Cynthia um she you know, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that my book wasn't a, a story of just men playing sports <laughs> and then, you know, hitting the bar <laughs> after. No, uh -uh. It, this was also a story about women entering sports like baseball, softball, tennis, basketball. Uh, and those were the main popular sports that I talk about with, with, with women playing those. Um, I think they were many, in many ways pioneers in, in integrating a lot of teams because it was women that actually would play in more integrated teams early on with softball and baseball. And because we don't really see that with men doing that early on, we see that more early with, with women in the 30s, right? Softball becomes sort of an acceptable sport for women, right? Because it's soft. But here's the thing. Women were playing hardball too. <laughs> so... So they actually joined the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, you know, a league of their own. If you watch a league of their own with Penny Marshall, right? That, well, directed by Penny Marshall, you would see that women were keeping the sport of baseball going while men were off fighting abroad, right? But it wasn't just, it wasn't just all American girls, right? It was Latinas as well playing that sport. In fact, we have over 12, Latinas that were in that league, uh, mostly from Cuba, but we also had several Mexican American female players from Southern California. So I talk about Marge Villa. Um, Marge Villa to me is one of those players that really 
just highlights how, you know, she used her bilingual, bicultural skills, right, to help the team during their tour to Latin America, right? So she becomes an ambassador of baseball for Latin America. Amazing, right? That here you have this, you know, five foot Marge Villa, who is an amazing player, catcher, and she played all positions. She plays with the Kenosha Comets and she stays for five years playing, right? Amazing, right? For five years. And uh, she goes to Latin America on two separate tours to then promote baseball throughout Central America, South America. And she talks about how she really saw that as a kind of like a like a role for her to play, like an ambassador role, because she really wanted to encourage young girls in Latin America to take on baseball. And because she felt like that, that was so important because it allowed her an opportunity to meet, to travel, right? To gain all these skills but it wasn't she wasn't seeing that being encouraged by a lot of the families so she made sure to to do that and, and i think that's just one of the ways she made inroads and and broke barriers is that she encouraged young girls to to play right and she, and she continues to do that i'm gonna um just jump in here for a second because one of the things we didn't talk about is that i said jose has written a, a number of books one of them is a collaboration with uh, with Chief Curator Ana Bermudez yep. and um, Richard Santillan, and this is from the cover of that book, and the book is called Mexican American Baseball in Ventura County, yep. and this is Aggie Trejo, and women are really, really featured in that book, which, by the way, you can get from the museum if you are interested, or you get in, we're happy to share some more photos. Actually, I'll put some more photos into the chat so you all can see them. Yeah. Right. So I have a couple more questions. Oops. Sure. I think we have time for like maybe one more. Maybe you have one more, probably. Okay, a couple more questions. So Maria Turan is asking, have you heard or read a book by uh, Mario yeah. Longoria? Yes, or, yes, okay. uh, football. I yep. do talk about football too. Um, in the last chapter, because uh, high school football becomes really big in East LA and many towns. And we also see, uh, we, we, I talk about the chili bowl <laughs> and the tortilla bowl, right? It's, it's hilarious. In one of the chapters, I talk about how, you know, American style football wasn't big in Mexico, right? So what they do is they, they send a lot of American coaches from the South to go train Mexican players to play the sport of football. It's part of the Good Neighbor Policy Program. So it actually was, there was an actual federal program to go to fund American coaches to go teach Mexican college players to teach, to play football. And so I, I do know about Marty Langoria's book uh, on football. It's a, it's, a, it's a great book. Marty Langoria actually helped me with, with a lot of the sources actually, um, because he, he was really uh, important in terms of putting it out that yes, we also play the sport of football. <laughs> it wasn't just, it wasn't just, I mean, I know it's like, you know, one of those sports that's like, you know, you have to be big and build, but yeah, we, you know, we also have that in, in Mexico and in high school uh, here in Southern California. So definitely. Great. So we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Diana Martinez wants to know when and how did soccer become come to eventually take such a prominent place among Latinos. Um, as for so many, the soccer field has been a critical source of friendship, connection, and joy. Yeah, you know, soccer doesn't really become big in Latino communities in the, in, in the United States until after World War II. They initially started in the 20s to form a football league, but it, but it, but it didn't make. Part of the reason is because there weren't enough players that they could recruit and in fact it wasn't it wasn't the fact that they that they weren't interested it just there wasn't a huge latino community in other words the, the, it was mostly a mexican community that primarily gravitated towards baseball and boxing not soccer why because when you look at the early uh, migration of that community it's coming from north central parts of mexico not from urban cities like mexico city where you see soccer being huge. Um, and even Guadalajara, right? Like it wasn't huge until after World War II. 
And that's when you see the first um, league forming, the California League. And the big uh, team was the Pan American uh, team that becomes really the Latino team that, that, that becomes really important in Southern California. And so I don't really go into that much into soccer, partly because I wanted to save it for another project that I'm working on, looking at the rise of soccer, um, like historically, like in, in Southern California. And that's, a, that's another chapter that I couldn't fit it in. Okay, last question, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Elena. Um, Cliff Rodriguez wants to know, how did the participation in these leagues transfer to Chicano youth playing in the local high school baseball teams? Yeah, you know, well, first, a lot of them didn't play high school baseball, right? They played community leagues, right? If they, basically, the, these leagues were formed by, you know, local community groups. It could be the, even the church got involved, uh, the organizations, of course. Um, you had businesses sponsor the leagues. It wasn't even high school, right? Literally, high school baseball doesn't really become big until well, the 40s, World War II, where they actually start forming more baseball teams after World War II. And so I think they already are playing like community baseball, semi-pro baseball, way before even high school baseball. High school baseball comes even later. Why? Well, because they weren't going to high school. <laughs> I mean, if you think about that time period, Mexican Americans were just barely getting through, uh, like junior high school, and then going on and working. Some of them that did continue into high school, great. They had only time to play, you know, maybe on the weekends, but not really in a more serious way as a sport, unless it went into college as well. But that's really later. Okay. Well, I was going to turn it over to Elena, but she's now got her. There she is. Okay. No, it's okay. My, my, I have a 10 year old here who doesn't, he doesn't respect this. He just has no respect. <laughs> anyway, Jose, I wanted to just, this has been so great and I could, we could can easily continue on for at least another hour. Um, and I know you'll write another book, so we'll do this again, but I Definitely. really want to thank you for sharing these, um, really interesting perspectives on sports and something we sort of perhaps take for granted just as entertainment value um, and sharing some of our, shedding some light on our local history. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure um, being with you and, and having a little a la mojito with you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, mine's gone. You, you, did, you did all the talking. So you, you know. uh, we will have our next episode of Local History History Happy Hour in two weeks with Jeff Mulhart, who has written a number of books on the history of Oxnard. So we'll be talking about that then. And until then, cheers. Cheers. And thank you all.